Good evening and welcome to this webinar from Liverpool Cathedral. In the cathedral we talk about Liverpool Cathedral being a place of encounter and we hope that you will encounter some of what we do at Liverpool Cathedral through these webinars. Liverpool Cathedral has over the past few years been keen to engage with science and religion and these webinars sit in the wider context of the importance of science and faith in the cathedral. The cathedral itself contributes into research-based practice and is part of something called the Liverpool Cathedral Postgraduate Learning Community. In that community, people come together to discuss matters of faith and many of them will have used the tools of the social sciences to reflect on a piece of research that they have undertaken in relation to God, the church and the world. There are now around 90 people connected to the community. As a cathedral, we have engaged in some research around Christmas attendance and the motivation of people to attend the cathedral for worship. It is good to have on the cathedral team people who have spent their academic lives in research. And I am grateful to the canon theologian, Leslie Francis, for his work and research around science and faith. And I'm also grateful to canon Mike, who is our canon scientist. Mike spends his working life as a scientist and has used his skills and experience to develop these lectures. He's done this since 2019 and they have become known as the Gilbert Scott Lecture on Science and Faith. The series name has been chosen since Dr. Sebastian Gilbert Scott, brother, brother of the famous architect Giles Gilbert Scott, who de designed Liverpool Cathedral, was a renowned clinical and clinician and radiologist in London. Thanks to all the speakers who will deliver these webinars, we are very grateful. I'm now going to hand over to Canon Mike, the Canon scientist, as the organiser of this series. Mike. Thanks very much indeed, Dean Sue, uh, and a very warm welcome for myself. As has been introduced, my name is Canon Mike, and the Residential Canon at the Cathedral, Canon scientist, and also university lecturer in radiotherapy physics and cancer sciences. It's a delight to welcome you all to the second Gilbert Scott lecture on science and faith for this year, all online because of the current situation. So I hope above all that you all stay well and safe in these still really challenging times. With us on this side of the camera, so to speak, are Dean Su, who herself is a researcher in empirical theology and psychology. Canon Neil, our canon for mission and faith development, whose own background is as an engineer. Canon Philip, our Canon presenter at the Cathedral, and Canon Stewart, our Diocesan Director of Communications and the technical wizard behind all our online lectures. As before, first some housekeeping points. Please feel free to submit any questions you have for our speaker tonight into the chat or public comment area on YouTube. And I will then ask those on your behalf of our speaker in the live Q&A that will follow a pre-recorded talk, which will run for approximately 40 minutes. All told, we'll finish at about 8.40, and then I hope you'll stay with us as Canon Philip leads us in a brief service of Compline of night prayer, so we close our evening in prayer. So today, our lecture is entitled The Science of Cathedral Studies, for which we are delighted to welcome our very own cathedral's canon theologian, the Reverend Canon Professor Leslie Francis. Leslie was ordained priest in 1974 in the Diocese of St. Edmundsbury and Ipswich. Since finishing his curacy in 1977, he has worked as an academic and welcomed opportunities for self-supporting ministry, including periods as priest in charge of rural parishes in Suffolk and then in Gloucestershire. He's a fellow of the British Psychological Society and currently serves as Professor of Religions and Psychology in the University of Warwick. He is best known for quantitative studies and is co-architect of the current survey concerning COVID-19 and Church 21. In this lecture, he will build on his book, Anglican Cathedrals in Modern Life, The Science of Cathedral Studies, which was 
published in 2015, and draw on the findings of the surveys conducted in Liverpool Cathedral during Christmas 2019. Leslie's kindly pre-recorded his talk, but as I say, he'll be with us to answer uh, any questions in a live Q&A afterwards. So without further ado, welcome to Leslie. And Neil is now going to play Leslie's talk for us. Jesus invited his followers to go and to observe the sower. He invited his followers to become scientists and to observe the way in which the sower was working with different kinds of soil, to observe the different kinds of soil, to categorize them, and to note the relationship between the kind of soil and the kind of growth. Jesus the scientist invited his followers to be scientists. Cathedrals too are in business to sow seed and the science of cathedral studies follows in the footsteps of the parable of the sower to observe the way in which the seed is being sown and the consequences of that. In this presentation, exploring the science of cathedral studies, I intend to do three things. I first want to explore what the science of cathedral studies might be about. I then want to explore the involvement of Liverpool Cathedral already within the science of cathedral studies. And thirdly, to focus on one particular example of the way in which Liverpool Cathedral has engaged in psychographic segmentation. I'll explain what that means later on in the presentation. And I hope by the end to be able to draw some conclusions and some recommendations. So what is the science of cathedral studies? Going on to my university campus, following the signs, I'd want to go to the Roots Building where I meet the social sciences. And what will I find among those social sciences? I will find a collection of different kinds of theories and different kinds of methods. I will look at sociology. I will look at anthropology. I will look at psychology. And one day I hope to find there in the Roots Building empirical theology as well. So what kind of literature underpins what I want to develop as a science of cathedral studies? It's the sort of literature I'd find in the Journal for the Scientific Study of Religion, a well-established, well-respected journal, and in the companion journal, Review of Religious Research. It's the kind of literature I'd find in the journal, Research in the Social Scientific Study of Religion, in the Archive for the Psychology of Religion, in Sociology of Religion. But where does empirical theology fit into that landscape? It's more recent on the scene. The Journal of Empirical Theology launched in 1987 and the International Society in 2002. But here theologians who are thoroughly convinced by Jesus the scientist and are drawing into the theological academy theories and methods developed within the social sciences. I've already drawn attention to the Jesus interested in the natural sciences, the Jesus who first encourages his followers to observe, categorize, but then eventually even to quantify, observe the growth. Some yield 35 fold, some 60 fold, some 100 fold. Jesus, the scientist, goes on to advocate methods of the social scientists. Go to the feast, says Jesus, and watch the way people behave. There are patterns in that behaviour. Some patterns to applaud, some patterns to criticise. Observe and interpret. 
Or when Jesus takes his disciples away to Caesarea Philippi, he invites them to do the work of the ordinary theologian, to listen to what people are saying. What do people say about me? Who do they say that I am? John the Baptist, Elijah, one of the prophets, having observed, having listened, what do you make of it, says Jesus, the social scientist. What about the occasion in Matthew's Gospel when John the Baptist sent out inquiries to Jesus? Are you the one who is to come or do we need to look for another? Jesus responds, go and tell John what you see. Go and tell John what you hear. The lame walk, the deaf hear, the blind see. Can you draw any conclusions from your observations of a theological nature? So what kind of stuff have empirical theologians been busy in in the last few decades? They've been interested in church congregations. They've been interested in church leaders. They've been interested in church visitors and now beginning to be interested also in cathedrals. So drawing on <clears throat> some of the work of my own research group, here's Congregation Studies, Church Watch. We looked at four geographical areas, drew on collaboration from four ministry training programs, drawing between 10 and 55 ordinands from each, and training them in the dis dis distinctive discipline of participant observation observing 189 services, making careful notes on what they'd seen and reflecting on their observations, began to open their eyes in new ways. Church congregations are easy to see because they meet together. Church leavers are more elusive, but in some senses more interesting. The second of my book on church leavers, Gone for Good with a Question Mark. 75 interviews form the basis of developing theory. But then we wanted to find a sample of church leavers. How could we find them? Random telephone calls, inviting people to talk to us. And from those random telephone calls, we identified 1,611 individuals who fitted the category of being church leavers and were willing to tell us more in questionnaires. 56% replied. Well, what about trying to study visitors to churches? Here was a study that engaged 165 rural churches, re had responses from nearly 13,000 visitors to those churches. It's on that foundation that the science of cathedral studies is building. My 2015 book drew together 10 distinctive studies from colleagues and friends. The first study looked at the cathedral engagement with young people across England. Owen and Tanya undertook that work and they did so by website analysis. We began to build up a systematic picture of how different cathedrals talked about what they were doing to engage young people. A second study, a study on cathedral congregations, wanted to test the prevalent thesis that people went to cathedrals to escape from the commitment of parish churches. We questioned that, and we imagine that many cathedral congregations do the same kind of job as parish churches of generating social capital that works inwards to the congregation and outwards to the cathedral. On this occasion, drawing on social capital theory in Clandaff Cathedral, we found nearly 300 participants from the three Sunday morning services. We concluded that that cathedral was generating a lot of social capital into the local community. <clears throat> A third study looked at motivational styles of cathedral congregations, and we suspected that different cathedrals 
were building very different kinds of congregations. We used religious orientation theory that distinguishes between the three orientations of intrinsic religion, extrinsic religion, and quest religion. Our three cathedrals convinced us that we were right. Different cathedrals are shaping different styles of motivation. The fourth study wanted to look at whether cathedrals were really different from parish churches. And we had the opportunity to do that by a large survey conducted throughout the Woolwich Episcopal area. Here, over 6,000 adults in the Woolwich Episcopal area churches, we could set alongside the 263 in the cathedral. It convinced us that the cathedral was drawing on a very distinctive population, an important one on which the diocese would miss out if it were not resourcing that cathedral. What about those distinctive things like carol services that take place in cathedrals? Who comes? Why do they come? Bishop David Walker led that piece of research with surveys in Worcester Cathedral and in Litchfield Cathedral. Over a thousand participants helped us to see the multiple motivation among those who attended, but at the heart, David identified a really secure Christian commitment. It helped him to shape his respect for those who only come once a year, but in coming, feel that they really belong, and it makes an impact upon them. The Cathedral Prayer Board, our colleague Tania has based her research on the ordinary theology that is revealed by ordinary people, the invisible congregation, as she calls it, among whom cathedrals and churches have the privilege of working. Taking a thousand prayers left from Bandit Cathedral, she began to open the eyes of that cathedral to the importance of its ministry with the invisible congregation. Another source of information that we sometimes really overlook are in the visitors' books. Our colleague Lewis Burton, again drawing on the ordinary theology theory developed by Jeff Astley, and on one cathedral, analyzed just over 3,000 entries in the visitors' book and began to draw attention to that cathedral about what could have been seen as missed opportunities in listening to the visitors and structuring experience in an appropriate way for them. An eighth study was informed by theory to do with the spiritual revolution, with the realization that people who visit cathedrals may come with serious spiritual quest, but asking rather different questions from the questions that cathedrals may think they're asking. St. David's Cathedral gave us the opportunity to listen to nearly 3,000 visitors and to make some recommendations as to how their spiritual quest might be more appropriately addressed by the cathedral. A ninth study, which we headed a gospel of inclusivity, drew on psychographic segmentation theory. The theory I'm going to talk about in greater depth later on in this presentation. Psychographic segmentation theory helped us to realize that there were some people who were much more likely to walk into the cathedral as a visitor than others, and we wanted to know why. The final study in that book, undertaken by our colleague Judith, was looking at the friends of cathedrals. She too began her research with a website analysis and then sent out questionnaires to friends of four cathedrals and began to draw on understandings of their motivation. So against that broader background of diverse approaches within the science of cathedral studies, Liverpool Cathedral too has been entering into that scientific tradition. It was last Christmas or rather Christmas 2019 that Liverpool Cathedral took seriously the opportunity of listening to those who came first to the holiday service and then to the two carol services on Christmas Eve. 
I wonder what we learned. We first learned that there was a real interest in the survey and a serious commitment to responding. So 564 participants of the holiday service, 1,234 participants of the two Christmas Eve carol services took part in that process of allowing us to listen to what it is they had to say. Four papers have come out for publication from the Hollybow Service. The first one I draw attention to has been done by Nelson. Nelson undertook a lot of hard work in the preparation for this project and has taken a particular interest in the qualitative material that has been put onto the survey. Most of my survey work is quantitative but I always leave the back page to invite people to write their own reflections. It's the analysis of the back page that takes time and gives insight into those areas that we might not have thought to give proper attention to in the quantitative work. What Nelson heard was to do with the location and with encounter, information that's really quite interesting for the current mission statement of the cathedral. Looking to the quantitative work from the Hollybow Service, three papers that looked at different aspects. The demographic profile, the motivation and intention, what people perceived the impact of attending had on them was the first focus for our research. The second, was trying to understand the extent to which Cathedral Hollywood service was reaching people who might not be otherwise reached by conventional services. Was this kind of activity doing the job that fresh expressions of church set out to do? The fourth study was one that tried to ask has attendance made any impact on the well-being of those who have come? Are con cathedrals contributing to well-being within their area? There are two ways we could approach that issue. One is by asking people whether their self-perception is that the cathedral character had an impact on them. The other, and the, the way we went, was to invite people to fill in a well-being measure when they first came into the service and the same well-being measure again at the end of the service. This gives us an indication of the change in well-being during the time of participation at the service. A really limited space of time and a limited outcome, but a serious attempt to begin to get some scientific data on what impact that attendance might have. Moving then to the Christmas Eve service, we are running through the same kind of sequence of data analysis. The first study that has been published already is looking at the theory of the way in which people belong, who belong through events. It's Bishop David Walker's work that has refined the thinking about distinguishing between activity belongers, those people who belong by coming regularly to activities, to services week by week or services month by month, and the people who belong by coming to events, the one-off things that happen at various times in the year. What we learned from the carol service and from the holy Band service, that many of the people who were there were there because they were there last year and they intend to come back next year. This is their cathedral, they belong, and the sense of belonging has an impact on who they are. But what about the next study that's coming out of the Christmas Eve carol service? It's this that I want to unveil and to give more time to in the third part of the presentation. Here is a paper with the title, The Science of Cathedral Studies and Psychographic Segmentation. O come, 
all ye thinking tongues. It's a title I've stolen from Bishop David Walker because the conclusion that he drew from his study in Litchfield and in Worcester was that thinking tongues were more inclined to come to cathedral carol services than they were to ordinary church services. <clears throat> now, what does all that mean? I need to unpack my understanding of psychographic segmentation and the distinctive characteristics of thinking types, a psychological profile quite often absent from church congregations. So what is the theory behind psychographic segmentation? How can psychological theory be used for this kind of segmentation? Are there really patterned interests, behaviours and expectations that can be predicted from knowing something of people's psychological profile? The leisure industry, the tourism industry, certainly believes that there is and invests quite heavily in this notion of psychographic segmentation. In order to progress thinking about psychographic segmentation, we need to do some serious thinking about what's meant by personality and how personality can be assessed. Within the world of the psychology of individual differences, there are probably three major personality fields that are quite different in their approaches. There's the three major dimensions of personality a theory rooted in the work of Hans Eysenck. There is the big five factors of personality, work rooted in Costa and McRae. The major three, UK in origin, the big five factors, USA in origin. And then there is psychological type theory. It's psychological type theory with which I prefer to work, but I need to justify that. Why psychological type theory? It is because this is a theory of personality that works well within empirical theology. I believe that theology, like psychology, is about the science of what it is to be human. But what differs theology from psychology is the model that we can have as theologians about the normative nature. What is the goal of being human? What is the theological end towards being human? And in doing that, a theology of individual differences enables us to distinguish between character and pathology and personality with a sharper lens than I believe that psychology itself is able to do. So psychological type theory enables, on my understanding, in non-evaluative, not to do with character, non-pathological, not to do with sickness, assessment of normal human individual differences. So then what are the distinctive things, the features about psychological type theory? It is that it's driven about a theory of what it is to be human, rather than a factor analysis of human differences. It talks about dichotomy rather than continua. And here this notion that it talks about, it's a language, it's a way of description. It's not a scientific claim. And I have to admit that psychological type theory is held in suspicion by a number of those working in a more traditional form of psychology of personality and individual differences. One of my own aims as a psychologist has been to try to mainstream psychological type theory. And one of the ways in which I try to do that is since 1996, most years, trying to present on that topic at the American Psychological Association. How is psychological type theory operationalized? And how is it measured? It's been popularized by the Myers-Briggs type indicator. This is an instrument that's really quite useful in one-to-one -one consultation. 
It has been made quite well known by the Kersey Temperament Sorter, an instrument that's available for self-analysis. My own contribution in building the Francis Psychological Type Scales has been to build a robust measure for psychological research. So what is psychological type theory? Here's a way of talking about individual differences that contain four main concepts. I shall introduce the names of the concepts, but then talk about them individually and give some depth to them. It talks about orientations. It talks about perceiving functions. It talks about judging functions. And it talks about attitudes. Now let's see how those four constructs may fit into a psychographic segmentation of church congregations and what we may learn from that. I first introduced the notion of psychological type theory into church congregation studies in the early 2000s and did so with a pilot project, just 185 church girls but the results intrigued. And as a consequence, a research student, Charlotte Craig, worked on building up a much better database. And following that, we tested the same theory among churchgoers in Australia. Those three studies give very similar results. And that began to impress me. So what do we learn about congregation studies? First, look at Jung's understanding of psychological orientations. Sources of energy. Jung argues that people diff are different. Introverts get their energy from within and extroverts from without. Introverts energize in quiet, extroverts energize in engagement. So where do you fit in? Are you the introvert who's reflective, private, find crowds draining, re-energize alone? Or are you the extrovert who is active, who is sociable, finds solitude draining and re-energizes it with others? Can we see how extroversion and introversion may shape different kinds of church congregations? So the orientation in church congregations, there's a bias towards introversion, only a slight bias. But if you observe Anglican church congregations, there's a very clear note that here is the place in which introverts are at home. Here are people who prefer an individual and reflective emphasis in church life, rather than social and active emphasis. Congregations shaped by a preference for introversion may unintentionally exclude extroversion. What about the perceiving process? Jung argues that people differ in the way in which they gather information. Some start with facts and evidence. Others start with theories and ideas. I wonder what your preference is. Are you the kind of person who builds up a picture in a practical way, preferring the concrete, preferring the conventional, concerned with details? Or are you the person who builds up a picture by inspiration, by abstract ideas, by being inventive, and by searching for meaning? And can you imagine that church congregation shaped by sensing types and by intuitive types might look quite different? So what's the perceiving preference in church congregations? There's a bias towards sensing. 80% of the people in the congregation prefer sensing. So here are people who prefer the traditional and conventional approaches to church life, rather than the innovative and novel. They prefer maintaining what has already stood the test of time, rather than speculating about new perspectives that may shape the future. Congregation shaped by a preference for sensing may unintentionally exclude intuitive types. 
What's the judging process about? Jung argues that there are two different ways in which people evaluate the data they've collected. Thinking types evaluate by logical analysis. Feeling types evaluate by interpersonal values. So I wonder, what do you prefer? Are you the thinking type who goes strongly for justice? Analysis tends to be firm-minded and tends to be critical. Or are you the feeling type who prefers harmony, a sympathetic approach, tends to be gentle, tends to be affirming? And can you imagine how church congregation shaped by feeling types and by thinking types may look different? So what is the judging preference in church congregations? There's a bias towards feeling. 60% of churchgoers prefer feeling. Here are people who prefer to promote harmony rather than tackle tough decisions. They prefer promoting a gospel shaped by the God of mercy than a gospel shaped by the God of justice. Congregation shaped by a preference for feeling may unintentionally exclude some thinking types. And now for the fourth component of Jungian psychological type theory, which is often referred to as attitudes, but this is a shorthand method for referring to attitude toward the outside world. How do people prefer to run their outside world? Is it with their perceiving process sensing an intuition where they're open-ended and flexible? Or is it with their judging process, thinking or feeling, where they prefer closure and decision? Here is the approach to the outside world, where judging types go for organisation and perceiving types go for flexibility. I wonder what your preference is. Is your preference for judging, where you're happy with routine, where you act on decisions, where long-term planning comes into play and you work badly under time pressure? Or is your preference for perceiving, where you're unhappy with routine, where you prefer to act on impulse, where immediacy is important and you work best under pressure of time? Can you imagine how church congregations look somewhat different if they are operated by perceiving types or by judging types? So what are the attitudes in church congregations? There's a bias towards judging. 86% prefer judging. Here are people who prefer to worship in a church that is tightly structured and adheres to regular pattern and discipline. They're unlikely to encourage spontaneity and unpredictability in church life. Congregations shaped by a preference for judging may unintentionally exclude some perceiving types. I wonder what encourages people to leave congregations. Here's a study that uses what I styled an index of satisfaction with congregational life. Data from nearly 2,000 people in congregations. And who proved to be most satisfied with their congregation life? The most prevalent type, introvert, sensing type, feeling type, judging type. They were the most content. And who were the most discontent? Extrovert, intuitive type, thinking type, perceiving type the mirror image of those who shape the dominant culture of church congregations. These are the people who get out and leave. That's why we need to be interested in psychographic segmentation to find out who's missing out because of our dominant preferences. It's looking for thinking types in church congregations to which David Walker drew our attention and I think was a very important quest. Let's look at how thinking is distributed in the population as a whole. Kendall's study 
gives us population norms for psychological type distribution. 65% of men in the population prefer thinking. 30% of women prefer thinking. Men prefer thinking, women prefer feeling. Two thirds of our church congregation are women. Our church congregations are being molded into preference for feeling. How do men who prefer thinking fit in? What do we find from our survey uh, of church congregations? 58% of the men in the congregation prefer thinking, 30% of women. Fewer men in the congregation than in the population shows us that in some ways, churches may be not, not making room for thinking terms. Walker's carol service opened our eyes. Here he found that 69% of the men in the congregation preferred thinking, and so did 39% of the women. That compares quite strongly with the picture that I built up of ordinary Anglican congregations. That's why Walker titled his paper, O Come All Ye Thinking Times. What's going on? Was this a one-off occasion? Just happens in Worcester Cathedral. The scientific approach is the approach of replication. My colleagues Owen Edwards and Taylor Rapshaw worked with me to look at those who came to the carol service in Bangor Cathedral. A smaller number, and not enough for us to, jet, to make separate analysis on men and on women. So we looked at the preference for thinking within the congregation as a whole. 52% of those present preferred thinking. That compares with 40% in the ordinary congregations that I'd surveyed, and 46% in the population. It seems that Walker may have discovered something that's worth exploring further. So the third study is a study that came out of our Hollybird service in Liverpool Cathedral. There are 441 participants. And again, I decided to analyze not taking men and women separately, but to look at the mood, the psychographic profile of the whole congregation. In that congregation, 48% preferred thinking, compared with 40% in ordinary congregations, and 46% in the population. Is it really the case that cathedral carol services are accessing a segment of the population that other church services are not accessing? Surely this is a job that fresh expressions of church, church should be doing rather than cathedrals. So I have been doing some work on psychographic segmentation of fresh expressions. Colleagues have worked in that field as well. Just four studies so far. And in none of those studies is there any evidence that fresh expressions of church are getting access to thinking types in a way that inherited church is not. This puts the cathedral carol service on a unique trajectory. So what do we learn about the Christmas Eve service? We learned that there were a large number of men and of women, so we can look at the two sexes separately. 64% of the men at the carol service preferred thinking, compared with 58% in the ordinary congregation and 65% in the population. We were on target for the population. Women, 43% preferred thinking, but compared with 30% in the ordinary congregations, and 30% of the population. O come all ye thinking types has the resonance. So what can I conclude from the study of the psychographic segmentation of the cathedral carol service? The science of cathedral studies recognizes that replication studies are important. Now four studies agree. Four is by no means enough, but it builds a foundation on which we can add further. What have we learned? Cathedral carol services do indeed achieve something special 
by the way in which they engage more thinking types within the church movement. Walker's initial study was also helpful in the way in which he began to theorize about the reason for the distinctive reach of cathedral carol services to embrace thinking types. Walker argues that thinking types may engage more easily on their own terms with the culture and atmosphere afforded by cathedral carol services than with other forms of Christmas services generally provided in Anglican parish churches, like Christingle, Nativity, and family services. Compared with the structure of cathedral carol services, each of these other provisions may be seen to have a more strongly relational atmosphere that may speak more strongly to the heart of feeling types and may be less accessible to, less appealing to, and less nurturing for thinking types. Walker recognises that cathedral carol services are not designed explicitly to engage the interests of thinking types by specific appeal to objective analysis and by dispassionate logic. Their benefit, he argues, is rather that they stand back from the predominant influence of relational engagement, favoured by worship leaders who themselves view the world through the lenses of preference for feeling. What are the limitations with our studies? Because the data have been generated by concentrating precisely and specifically on carol services, the findings cannot be extrapolated to other forms of service. Walker's theorizing about the appeal of cathedral carol services nonetheless opens for investigation <clears throat> the view that other services more routinely provided by cathedrals could equally offer a greater distance from a context of emotional and relational engagement. The discipline structure of the Cathedral Choral Eucharist and of the Cathedral Choral Evensong may share many of the characteristics of the Cathedral Carol Service. Moreover, both of these forms of service provide opportunity for intelligent preaching that could engage the mind of thinking types. So if this were the case, then cathedrals may already be making a distinctive provision for thinking types who fall into Walker's category of activity belongs by attending weekly or monthly to recurring activities, as well as the thinking types who fall into Walker's category of event belongs by attending those one-off events throughout the year. So what next? The way through which the science of congregation studies and the science of cathedral studies could address this speculation is by inviting congregations attending choral Eucharist and choral cathedral even songs to participate in an appropriate survey. So far, just one cathedral has already done so. And that cathedral is Southwark Cathedral. Southwark Cathedral demonstrated that on its normal Sunday, a higher proportion of thinking types were in the congregation than in normal Anglican churches. So what next? The next priority for the science of cathedral studies could be, build, could be to build on that study conducted in Southwark, Southwark Cathedral by conducting similar studies in other cathedrals to establish whether or not cathedrals offer a significant bridge to those thinking types left unreached both by inherited church and by fresh expression of church. Jesus invited his followers, followers to go and observe the sower. The cathedral sows important seed. It is worth observing how growth takes place. Thank you. Thanks very much indeed, Leslie, for a fascinating uh, discourse and presentation. Uh, I'm sure there will be some questions as they come in, as people are typing them into the chat room. Perhaps I could uh, start off with uh, quite a few that I've, I've written down. We'll start off with one or two. Um, 
you focus naturally the, uh, on the results of uh, cathedral studies, but do you feel in more general that it could be applicable to different churches or even different faiths from the, the types of understand and studies that you've undertaken? Th thank you, Mike. Yes, um, the psychographic segmentation does allow us to see some of the important differences between different streams of churches. I indicated that the work we'd done on Anglican churches tended to find an introverted culture. One of my closest colleagues from the early 1980s, um, Professor William Kay, happens to be an Assemblies of God pastor and taught for a fair part of his career in Mattersey Hall. I've done quite a bit of work with William. I don't find the Assemblies of God community to be quite so introverted as the Anglican community. But then I've moved more recently into New Frontiers and I find New Frontiers much more masculine, much more extroverted than Assemblies of God. My research on church leavers found an important reason for leaving was people saying, I don't fit into this place. I felt uncomfortable. I needed to get out. And it was that that led me to want to put forward an image of collaboration between churches that I styled a multiplex church. I would rather that there was not a door at the back that people left from, but doors at the side. I'm really fed up with this quiet Anglican environment. Let me move on and see whether Assemblies of God will be different. And perhaps I could walk through their side door and end up in New Frontiers. Um, but with an image of the multiplex church, we are not in collaboration. We're not in uh, competition, but in collaboration. And I kind of build that, root that, in a theology of individual differences, which imagines that not only does Genesis 1, 27 point as to God creates male and female in the image of God, but God creates black and white in the image of God, and indeed even introvert and extrovert. And if that's the case, there should be room in churches for all types. Excellent, excellent, thank you. Um, there's a question that's just come in. Uh, so my, my next question will have to wait a while really. So um, how might more cathedrals be persuaded to take part in such research opportunities, Leslie? That's a really interesting question. Um, I think so much depends on the leadership within cathedrals. Um, what sets the tone of cathedrals? And who sets the criteria on which decisions may be made? Um, listening to Sue's introduction, we were reminded that there may be an intelligent inquiry in Liverpool Cathedral that would work on the basis that scientific knowledge is not irrelevant. Um, I was delighted when I got the opportunity to talk to the College of Deans um, about a vision for collaboration among cathedrals that could be inquiry based. And I do, I think, see the potential for Liverpool Cathedral as leading the way in that. But that way is rooted in a clear theological understanding of the kind of God in whom we believe and also a clear understanding in the relationship between the doctrines in which we work. A cathedral rooted in a doctrine of creation that celebrates diversity may well have opportunity to work with diverse people and to understand the differences among them. Excellent, thank you. Um, I'll ask one further of my many questions before inviting my colleagues on the panel to perhaps uh, put forward a question really. So um, it was great to see the analysis from the 2019 services really and what was coming through from those and great to see those in publication so it gets a more 
wider readership across the world, really. Could you highlight what perhaps you felt was missing after you analyzed the results? Was there something that you said you felt we should have asked about that or we need to look further into a particular aspect from that perspective? Thank you, Mike. Um, first of all, I'd just like to pick up and thank you for drawing attention to publications. Mm -hmm. Because part of what I want to say to Church is that science works through the peer review process. What disappoints me about a lot of in-house research within Church, um, as we may even find by national headquarters, mm -hmm. is that it goes nowhere near the peer review process. And I'm not clear that we can actually um, value research that's not put in that process. It's been interesting listening to radio during the development of vaccines and actually hearing the weight placed on peer review. Now the question, what didn't we do? There was more that we didn't do than that we did um, because you can only carry so much cargo in one particular tool. And when we set out with this first attempt in Christmas 2019, we decided to go for broad brush. We wanted to cover a fair bit of territory in, um, in surface level to see what it led to. We decided to focus on two things in depth. One was psychographic segmentation and the other was measuring of well-being. The paper on the impact of the cathedral carol service on perceived well-being, I think is really quite an important thing to have done. But here is some real scientific evidence that we're making a contribution to society. Now you notice that I've been following politicians and I've not answered your question. If there was one bit that I really regret we were not able to put in, was something I referred to in the earlier part of my 2015 book about motivation and religious orientation theory. Quest orientation, intrinsic orientation and extrinsic orientation. Not exclusive entities. People can be engaged in more than one. But my impression, having learned from Southwark Cathedral, is that quest is something that cathedrals can cope with more easily than parish churches. We can afford to ask questions that sometimes parish churches feel they can't ask. But that too is totally consistent with a scientific endeavor. Excellent, thank you. Uh, I think I'd, I'd echo that from my own scientific background. We often say that the best, best of scientific research brings forward more questions than we actually can come up with any sort of models or answers for. Um, any questions from my colleagues at this stage, really from, from uh, Canon Neil or Canon Philip or Dean Sue uh, to put forward or comments? Uh, Neil. Leslie, th thank you for that. Um, there's a lot of data in there to absorb. I, one of the stats that you came up with, which really hit me between the eyeballs, was when you said, if I got it right, that the percentage of sensing types in parish churches, was it 80%, 80%? Which I find quite staggering. Um, and I wonder if cathedrals are even more likely to attract sensing types. Uh, and as somebody who is completely at the opposite end uh, as, as an intuitive, I wonder, therefore, uh, perhaps it explains why I've had some colourful and vigorous discussions with my parochial church councils in past uh, lives, um, because if I'm coming from a very intuitive point of view, despite having been trained as a scientist, incidentally, which is curious perhaps. But what can we do perhaps at the cathedral to appeal to, to us intuitive types if it's not happening so readily at parish church level? 
So there's more, probably more than one question there. Yeah, I'd like to have a go at answering each one if I could remember what they were. Um, the, the first point is 20% um, prefer intuition in ordinary congregations. But we also have to remember that within society as a whole, the proportion of people who prefer intuition is probably about 28%. So less in congregations than in the population, but not that much less. What really fascinates me is the way in which the Church of England chooses intuitives for ministry to lead sensing congregations. And that does lead to quite a lot of conflict. Another way of choosing clergy is the way in which local or day ministry works, where congregations call out the vocations of people into uh, listening to a different kind of call. Now, the work I've done on ordained local ministry tells me that those who are selected in that way are much less likely to prefer intuition than those selected in the traditional way. I've also discovered that the clergy in Wales are less likely to prefer intuition than those in England. Lots of variability. The data I've got from Southwark Cathedral tells me that there are more intuitives in that congregation than there are in parish churches. And I think one of the things that attracts intuitives to cathedrals is the musical environment that speaks to an ethereal spirit. There is also the opportunity of more challenging preaching that opens minds. Um, cathedrals not only work more with thinking types, they also work more with intuitive types. But the door needs to be opened further. Excellent. Thank you, Leslie. Um, one question I've I've I've, I've always had, and, and I'm I'm no expert in 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 this area of of science in any way. I often have a feeling that your type personality can depend upon context, a bit like fight and flight, mm -hmm. in that we respond perhaps in ways we would not normally do so, dependent upon the environment in which we actually find ourselves. Do you get any sort of feel for all your wealth of studies as, as how, um, it's a bit like Schrodinger's cats, actually doing the experiment or the context itself directs the responses in a particular way? And how, how can you kind of shield against that sort of thing, if indeed that happens? What, what have you found, Leslie? Yeah, I, to answer that question, we have to go some depth into Jungian psychological type theory. Now, what we need to hear about that theory is that its surface appearance is on the general preferences that people show, the way they normally behave. But the theory suggests that we each has access to each of the four main functions, sensing, intuition, feeling, thinking. They develop at different stages to, during the journey of life. They develop both an extroverted and introverted form, but also at different stages of the journey of life. And there are contexts that draw into play really the opposing functions from those that we expect. And they come into play in sometimes quite sinister and dangerous ways. Um, I produced a book last year with my colleague Chris Ross from Canada that tried to look at the dynamics of the eight functions, how they play out specifically in clergy lives, and what is it that gets the less developed functions coming to the fore and generating conflict. It would happen, for example, when I meet my opposite and my opposite calls out those functions within myself that are less well-developed. 
and I try to fight back with those and fail. That's interesting. That's really interesting work there, Leslie. Thank you. Um, just a couple more questions, really, before we, I think, we'll draw things to a close for this evening and we'll come together in prayer. It was really interesting, one of your earlier points on your slides, you were talking about uh, investigations with ordinance. How much do you feel some of this work needs to be part of that formational training? I know it's difficult throwing in uh, some aspects of social sciences without us being experts like yourself in actually exercising it and working with it. But do you think there needs to be more information drawn into this for newly ordained uh, priests and deacons in terms of observing their own congregation? Um, and in learning about themselves, the question is, what is the journey of Christian discipleship really leading to? If one takes uh, an end of human development, then maturity comes into play. And it doesn't come into play spontaneously, but needs to be worked at and needs to be formed. I don't think teaching psychology makes any difference to the way in which people actually behave. But being in formational communities that are aware of psychological dynamics can be transformational. So I want to argue that there's place in the seminary, both for teaching social science, but even more importantly, for structuring community life by those who are alert to the insights that social sciences have. Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, and to save my ask, I'll, I'll ask my further questions when we next meet over coffee. Uh, a question has just come in, so, so in terms of uh, those who've been watching. Um, so we'll, we'll finish with this one before we draw things to a close. So one or two, uh, the questioner puts forward one or two simplistic questions. What does the buzzword identity mean? in your sphere of research. And what about gender? Is this a dichotomy, binary or continuum? Um, so, first of all, I have to talk about psychological type people as employing binary language. It's a model from which to try to scope reality. When we talk about sex differences in a psychological language, we're talking about the identity of biological sex, and we're looking at the psychological correlates that go with that. Now, overall, I might say that I find a higher proportion of feeling types among women than among men. But among men, there is as much variation in feeling and thinking, as there is between the sexes. Um, the binary notion doesn't work. It's much more complex than that, but it nonetheless provides a language through which we can begin to scope the journey. Okay, thank you, Leslie, thank you. As usual with these sessions, uh, and particularly with the q and I find that time has has beaten us somewhat really. So uh, we'll draw things to a close for now. Um, could I thank on behalf of all the, the virtual audience really uh, and ourselves on the panel. Thank you, Leslie, for a most illuminating and a really thought provoking uh, presentation uh, tonight. I'm going to look back over it uh, and look into that in more depth. You really you covered so many different points uh, and it was really great to see and understand a bit of the science of cathedral studies. So on all of our behalf, thank you very much indeed for a most illuminating presentation and thanks very much indeed for your work within cathedrals itself and all of your co-authors. Really. So a virtual applause all the way through for that really. Thank you, Les. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Um, Neil, if you could share your screen with us again, please, for the next lecture. So many thanks everyone for attending this lecture. 
uh, and I hope you'll be able to join us next Tuesday for our third one. Uh, and that one, when the slide comes up, thanks very much, Neil, uh, is going to be given by the Reverend Dr. Alex Baker, who is both a consultant orthopedic surgeon and also a priest here now in Liverpool Diocese. He will share his thoughts and experiences from the sharp end on surgery, science and faith. Please spread the word about these free online lectures to your friends and colleagues, and also the fact that if people miss them live, they are all available to watch again later on our YouTube channel. They're all saved on there. So thanks very much again for uh, joining us this evening. Uh, we're very pleased to have your company with us. Take care, go gently, and we hope to see you again next week. Now, I do hope you'll stay online with us now, though, for our brief service of Compline, being led tonight by Canon Philip, and Canon Neil will voice the words of the congregational re responses on all our behalves. The Lord Almighty grant us a quiet night and a perfect end. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Who made heaven and earth? Most merciful God, we confess to you before the whole company of heaven and one another that we have sinned in thought, word and deed and in what we have failed to do. Forgive us our sins. Heal us by your spirit and raise us to new life in Christ. Amen. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and shall be forever. Amen. I will bless the Lord who has given me counsel. At night also he has instructed my heart. I have set the Lord always before me. He is at my right hand and I shall not fall. Therefore, my heart is glad and my spirit rejoices. My flesh also shall rest secure. For you will not give me over to the power of death, nor suffer your faithful one to see the pit. You will show me the path of life. In your presence is the fullness of joy, and from your right hand, flow delights forevermore. Give us, O God, a glad heart and a clear conscience, that as we come to this day's end, we may rest in peace with Christ our Lord. Amen. You, O Lord, are in the midst of us, and we are called by your name. Leave us not, O Lord our God. Into your hands, O Lord, I commend my spirit. Into your hands, O Lord, I commend my spirit. For you have redeemed me, Lord God of truth. I commend my spirit. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Into your hands, O Lord, I commend my spirit. Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, to be a light to lighten the Gentiles, and to be the glory of thy people, Israel. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, 
as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. So let us pray. We pray this night for all engaged in scientific research, and particularly this evening for those in the social sciences. We give thanks for the ministry and witness of the cathedral churches of this land, and particularly of our own. And we pray for all those who seek God, that they would find him. Blessed Lord, who caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, grant us so to hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that by patience and the comfort of your holy word, we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you have given us, in our Saviour, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, for ever and ever. Amen. May God bless us, that in us may be found love and humility, obedience and thanksgiving, discipline gentleness and peace. Amen.